Uh, welcome to the Faculty of the Built Environment at the University of New South Wales. I'm Alex Arnus. I'm the Dean here. And it's really a, a great privilege to have tonight um, Susan Thompson and Tony Capon, who are together the co-directors of the Healthy Built Environment Program, uh, working through our research centre, City Futures Research Centre, and also working, of course, with um, core funding from the New South Wales uh, New South Wales Health. Um, healthy cities is a fascinating topic in my opinion and research in this area will underpin significant change in the future. And I'm, I'm an architect and urban designer by background and many of you may, may not always share the architectural perspective which sometimes views planning with some scepticism, particularly in the state of New South Wales. <laughs> but I, I'm not like that. I want to tell you right away that I've seen extraordinary um, Im improvements in our lives through the work of planning. And underpinning the work of planning is the work that goes on in universities. And I would say what goes on in our university leads the nation in this area of developing a future which is more vital, more healthy, more sustainable, and really from evidence-based research. So what, what are some of those changes? For me, one of the big moments was when they built the Woolworths building in New York City and they thought a catastrophic outcome would be that the, the health of the city would suffer because there was no more light sun onto the streets. So they developed zoning and they had Hugh Ferris model what the outcome would be. And for those of you who know those drawings, they're exquisite drawings and New York City looks like planners thought it would look like before it was built. And you can go back to Burnham and Bennett, you can go back to the London Fire, but the connection between health, development, sustainability and planning for me is, is absolutely integrated and completely important to our future. And, and I would say the work that our associate professor Susan Thompson, of course our news professor and our visiting professor Tony Capon uh, are doing is incredibly important to our faculty and I would say to our city and I would say would underpin some of the decisions that will need to be made by Clover Moore and her team to, to implement their 2030 plan and will underpin a completely different paradigm for how our children will live in the future. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Susan first, I think, to introduce her topic tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for Tony and I to be part of the 2010 Utsun Lecture Series. We thank the Dean, Professor Alexanes, for inviting us to be part of the series and we warmly welcome you all. We acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and their elders past and present. And we pay tribute to their stewardship of the land and the traditional ways in which they lived in harmony with their environment. We'd also like to thank the Healthy Built Environments Program Senior Research Officer Joanna York, PhD candidate and research assistant with the program Jennifer Mainfield, and research assistant student planner Andrew Wheeler on placement with us for their assistance in the preparation of this Utsun lecture. And we also acknowledge very, very importantly and very, very warmly the inspiration of our students who are studying in the area of healthy built environments. We dedicate this lecture to their future, to their future with what we hope will be an environmentally sustainable and healthy world. And I suppose, as they usually say, all, um, uh, well, I have to take all responsibility. Most of the images in the presentation tonight are mine um, and some of Tony's, unless otherwise indicated. Our topic this evening is healthy cities. And when we reflect on the Opera House and the genius of architect Jörn Utzen, it might not immediately occur to us that this is a healthy built environment. 
Watson's great design is indeed the essence of what healthy cities are all about. Cities where people from all walks of life can meet and intermingle. Cities where citizens are culturally inspired and uplifted. Watson's Opera House provides many opportunities for conviviality in an urban place that gives all citizens the right to access the harbour and its breathtaking beauty. And Utzon's Opera House is certainly host to much physical activity, a critical element of a healthy city. Music is also and very much at the heart of the Opera House. And while not necessarily part of healthy built environments, music is acknowledged by our colleagues in health as very important for mental and physical health. And this image is the gala opening concert, concert of the Sydney Opera House in 1973. And I'm incredibly proud to acknowledge my mum, violinist Ruth McKayley, who performed on that occasion. And I, I'm sad that my mum isn't here tonight, but I know she's thinking of us. This evening, our lecture ranges across the main elements of healthy built environments. We set the contemporary health and built environment context and the links between the two. I will then talk about healthy placemaking. Tony will discuss environmental sustainability and health, and we will conclude the lecture with an overview of Australian policy and practice initiatives that support the creation of healthy built environments. We will close by reflecting on some of the challenges and opportunities presented by this work. In setting the scene for our lecture tonight, it is useful to consider the key issues. For health professionals, the burden that chronic disease, particularly non-communicable disease, places on our sick care facilities is escalating at an alarming rate. This is a trend which cannot continue. Nor can the way that we in the built environment professions have, in a sense, designed out physical activity and social interaction as part and parcel of daily life. And these are two key components of what a healthy city needs to be. The health sector is increasingly shifting to a greater focus on prevention. And there is increasing recognition by both health and built environment professionals of the role that the built environment can play in supporting health and well-being. So let's turn to consider some of the big health issues of today. Obesity in Australia is on the rise, and you probably already know that and hear about that quite a lot. The most recent estimates of the impact of obesity show that it causes almost one quarter of type 2 diabetes and one quarter of osteoarthritis, around one fifth of cardiovascular disease and similarly one fifth of some of the most common cancers, colorectal, breast, uterine and kidney. And it's been estimated that the overall cost of obesity to Australian society and governments was $58.2 billion in 2008 alone. That's the total, total cost. And those figures are from Access and Economics uh, 2008. Obesity, together with tobacco and alcohol, feature in the top seven preventable risk factors that influence the burden of disease. We see from this graph that the incidence of obesity is growing and will more than likely overtake tobacco use as the highest risk factor for chronic disease. And some reports indicate that this has already occurred. We also see that physical inactivity is the fourth most significant preventable cause of illness and premature death for Australians, and that low fruit and vegetable consumption is a significant contributor to the burden of disease. Type 2 diabetes, highly related to obesity and lack of physical activity, is projected to become the leading cause of disease burden for males and the second leading cause for females by 2023, mainly due to the expected growth in the prevalence of obesity. 
And if this occurs, annual health care costs for type 2 diabetes will, will increase astronomically from $1.3 billion estimate to an estimated $8 billion by 2032. In relation to physical activity rates, just over half of the New South Wales population does the recommended level of at least 30 minutes of physical activity on most days of the week. Inadequate physical activity results in significant health care costs, particularly as it contributes to chronic conditions such as heart disease, stroke and type 2 diabetes. The direct costs alone of these conditions have been estimated by Medibank Private, and they're certainly interested in the costs of these things, to equate to $4 billion nationally a year of, the, and of direct costs over $1.5 billion attributable to physical inactivity. And this is the, the last um, perhaps doom and gloom um, image, so I, I will get over uh, through this. But I think it's very important that you see the, the urgency of the task and what, um, what the issues around health are. Mental health is also a, a serious concern. And you can see from this chart, and I apologise if it's not too clear, um, but it, um, the, the chart shows mental disorders are a significant contributor to the overall burden of disease. Well, in reflecting on current health conditions, as I have, have done, it's interesting to note that the history of health and the built environment is very closely linked. Indeed, urban planning originated out of concerns for human health, particularly the polluted and crowded city slums. And of course, this was at a time, a very different time in history to where we are today, when infectious disease rates were very high, unlike the major health problems that we face today. The creation of zoning enabled the separation of dirty, polluting land uses from where people lived. And we saw as the fledgling discipline of planning evolved the birth of the Garden City movement, which was for a time a very healthy way to live. And this mural is in Sydney's uh, Haberfield suburb. The suburb today still a fine example of the Garden Sydney suburb concept. But things changed. The suburbs grew. The motor car became readily available. And the distance between where we lived and where we worked increased, and our lives became more and more sedentary. And while health professionals continue to have a keen interest in the role of the environment as a determinant of health, perhaps most succinctly summarised in this diagram, the determinants of health, the built environment moved away from its historical origins focusing more on the, the health of the environment, very, very important, but not overtly on human health. That is, until quite recently. And I'll start to now unpack some of the ways in which built environment professionals are once again considering health. Here in the built environment faculty, we think about the relationship between the environment and health at different scales. It can start with the chair on which we sit and our colleagues in industrial, in, in industrial design work at this particular scale. And of course, the internal design of our buildings. Stairs are an increasingly important aspect of healthy, healthy building design. <coughs> and while they may not be a great design feature of a building, this image actually of the stairs in the red centre, there is more focus on making the stairs the easy option. Sometimes with a specific health promotional message such as this one here that I found in a Hong Kong subway some years ago to encourage people to take the steps. And I guess at the moment we have our own promotional message in the red centre 
with the closure of one of our lifts currently undergoing long-term modernisation. <laughs> but even when the stairs are provided and are a convenient option, we don't always take up the invitation to be active. And thanks particularly to Jennifer, my PhD student, who took this image for me the other day in the QVB building. So you will now never go to this point in the QVB building and not take the stairs. Very, very good. So you'll be adding that few minutes extra to your physical activity for the day. Or cursing me. <laughs> well, I now turn to a focus on the neighbourhood scale of the built environment as I discuss healthy placemaking. In essence, healthy placemaking is about creating places that encourage physical activity, that bring people together, that provide a sense of belonging for diverse communities and support healthy eating and access to fresh, nutritious foods. And I think it's important to note that, the, that placemaking and the, um, the, the the sorts of theories and issues around placemaking have long been advocated by urban planners, designers, landscape architects and geographers. And this legacy has much to offer us in healthy placemaking. Writing in the early 1960s, Jane Jacobs, and you no doubt many of you recognise the cover of her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, she offered a damning critique of a particular form of planning which ignored people and their connection to place. She argued that people-centred cities are those where safety, walkability, sense of belonging and vibrant street life are protected and nurtured. And we have on the either sides of Jane Jacobs' um, book cover there more recent um, and contemporary placemakers, although interesting to note that Jan Gell's wonderful book, which I commend to you if you, haven't, um, if you haven't explored this book, Life Between Buildings, initially published in the 1970s and since many times um, reprinted. And many of you will know Jan Gell's work. Um, and indeed, I see him very much as a contemporary placemaker. This um, newer publication, A Compendium of Practical Placemaking, is where Jan, together with his colleagues, augments the ideas in his earlier work. And his attention is on ordinary, everyday places and the ways that they can facilitate healthy and happy lives, as well as contributing to environmental sustainability. So let's consider exactly what might make a healthy place. Healthy places support access to healthy food. And this can be provided in a variety of ways. Community gardens provide access to fresh, cheap and culturally appropriate fruits and vegetables, as well as bringing people together through different gardening practices. These women are from culturally diverse backgrounds in a community garden in the Redfern Waterloo public housing estate. With UNSW colleagues, social worker Linda Bartolome, urban designer and architect Bruce Judd and landscape architect Linda Corkery, our research on these gardens revealed significant mental and physical health benefits for the participants. Healthy food is increasingly found in local street gardens where residents decide to plant out their unused nature strip with different types of produce. And this is an image of a nature strip in Marrickville. Indeed, in some situations, whole villages are being planted with edible produce. And this is incredible edible Todd Morden in Yorkshire in the UK. I uh, visited uh, last year and met Nick Green, the avid and avid gardener and activist who showed me around the village of Todd Morden. The gardens throughout the whole village are productive 
and they also not only provide fresh food um, for people who, who want to partake of the opportunity, they're an important opportunity for community interaction. So too are the traditional allotments in the UK. Now more popular than ever, some of them associated with the, um, with, with the growth in organic farming. And this particular image is of some allotments in Newcastle-on-Tyne in the north of England. And perhaps as we live in more consolidated urban forms, our rooftops will be home to produce gardens as depicted in this Looney cartoon. Farmers' markets are being established in cities and regional centres across Australia. This one in the heart of Sydney. This one, Parap Market in Darwin in the Northern Territory. Healthy eating is also associated with conviviality and social connection. As our community celebrations around healthy food, which can be both educative and a lot of fun. And I came upon this last year when I was visiting Newcastle on Tyne in the UK, a community apple day. And it was indeed a fun day and quite a delicious day. Some of the best apples I think I've ever tasted in my entire life, just amazing. And another image from a celebration around, around food and conviviality, this fruit and veggie parade in Adelaide in South Australia. Finally, in relation to the provision of healthy food, the retention of prime agricultural land to grow food in reasonable proximity of city populations is of growing and considerable concern. Zoning restrictions and a slowing of suburban growth are part of the solution that has to be investigated and adopted increasingly. Particularly as we see suburban development more and more in competition with agricultural land use. These are houses on the south coast of New South Wales. So what else might a healthy place be? Well, healthy places are about encouraging physical activity, particularly important for children as we set down those patterns in early life, but important, critically important for all of us. The importance of green spaces for health has long been acknowledged. And we see this in the classic study by Ulrich of people in hospital settings where he found that even a view of green space reduced recovery time from illness and surgery. Healthy cities provide different opportunities to be, for people to be active in green outdoor spaces. And at this point, I'd like to acknowledge the, the excellent work of my and Linda Corkery's PhD student, Helen Kendall, who is working with us examining green space and older people. And that promises to be a really wonderful study as she delves into the relationship between natural open spaces and older people's needs. Other spaces in healthy cities might well be more and more dog parks, and no doubt many of you know your local dog park. Some call them the new village green. This one providing opportunities for physical activity, for much conviviality and an inter interactive atmosphere. It has both physical and mental health benefits. And research from our colleague, director of the University of Western Australia's Centre for the Built Environment and Health, Professor Billy Giles Corti has revealed that those who own dogs walk more than dog owners. And indeed, Billy's centre has been very much the leading centre in Australia on the research into the relationships between the built environment and health. And those of you interested in exploring research in this area further, 
would well be advised to visit her, um, her website. This space here providing dancing opportunities in a Beijing park. This award-winning water play park in the centre of Cairns, far north Queensland, provides a wonderful environment for children to be active and happy. And of course, in the amazingly warm environment, a very culturally and environmentally appropriate design response to the people's needs in that area um, responding to the, the, the weather, the, the warm weather and the delight of water play all, pretty much all year round. But not all open spaces are necessarily well designed or design winning as this one is. They may well be ordinary, everyday, local parks, the sort we find in most Australian neighbourhoods. This is an important green space that supports active communities and families being together. And importantly in Australia, outdoor areas need to be shaded. Shading is essential for protection from excessive sun exposure, particularly for young children. And this is all the more urgent given our very high skin cancer rates in Australia. And all members of the community need to have opportunities for physical activity. This image, very, very generously provided by one of my students, Juliet Kavanagh, who's currently studying older people and open space as part of her Bachelor of Planning thesis end of year, uh, end of uh, Bachelor of Planning thesis project. Thank you to Juliet. And also I'd like to acknowledge the excellent work that's being done by Gary Shields, PhD candidate, working with me and Professor Bill Randolph here in the built environment, looking also at comprehensive notions of healthy ageing in the built environment. As part of an active environment, healthy places encourage cycling. Cycling is more of increasing interest to many people. And indeed, today, we celebrate Ride to Work Day. And I'm sure many of you rode to work, and I, I, I could ask for a show of hands, but I think it's um, barely a week goes by and we don't have some celebration, some day, to focus on being healthy. Um, so today, Ride to Work Day. And there were apparently quite a lot of activities around that. Copenhagen is an exemplar in privileging cycling over the motor car with policy and expenditure commitments to the provision of extensive cycleways throughout that city. And of course, cycling is an environmentally sustainable form of transport. Melbourne is actively encouraging cycling. This image of one of many cycling hire facilities that are now scattered throughout the CBD in Melbourne. Sydney's still struggling, despite the excellent work and the commitment of the City of Sydney Council to provide cycling paths. This was front page of the Herald some a few months ago. In New South Wales, less than 1% of all trips are by bike. And under the recently released New South Wales Bike Plan, the aim is to increase this to 5% of all trips by 2016. Healthy places encourage walking. There's a significant and growing increase on the importance of walking. Walking for both transport, as an element of daily transport. And the research in this area indicates that walking rates do increase in places where things are close by, where shops, services and public transport are well linked, where there's mixed use planning and where streets are well connected. Generally with a traditional street grid design and where there is medium density housing with higher population densities. So all of those qualities 
form what we increasingly are calling a walkable neighbourhood, which is a, a fundamental for a healthy neighbourhood, a healthy place. Walking for recreation is also very important and incredibly popular. It outstrips all other leisure activities associated with physical activity. The research shows that access to beaches, facilities and parks, good pedestrian infrastructure, owning a dog, as I said before, and really great aesthetics all combine to enhance and encourage people to get out and walk, to walk for recreation. And walking for recreation is also very important around social connection and, and being together and sharing. Healthy places support community interaction and belonging. Such spaces are found in local neighbourhoods. They involve people interacting with their neighbours as well as strangers and those who are different to them. This town square in Italy, this one in Alice Springs in the centre of Australia's desert. Healthy places bring diverse community members together in places where they have a sense of belonging or can certainly build a sense of belonging. No matter who they are, their age or preferred activity, and no matter what their cultural background might be. Healthy placemaking is about linking the socio-cultural with physical land use. It's about creating places that meet the needs, the hopes and dreams of people, no matter what their gender, age, cultural and religious background, sexual orientation and ability. Healthy places are friendly and safe. They're walkable places where people are out and about and where people can meet with each other in familiar surroundings where they do have a sense of belonging. And indeed, a safe environment is the foundations of a healthy environment. Ensuring our places and spaces are safe is an incredibly aspect of building healthy places. And finally, healthy placemaking leaves room for the unexpected. Healthy places are those that hold surprises for, for us as we move through them. As Jan Gell says, a reason to think about life and smile. This is actually an image of a giant teacup and teapot in a park in Sydenham, which has a whole history to it around the community and the intrusion of aircraft noise. I happened across this in a Perth CBD street. Some of you may know the kangaroos hopping down the street. It certainly made me smile and pause for a while. Here's another, I guess, interesting um, sculpture that I came across some years ago in Hong Kong, an intriguing life-size group of very interesting people. And just some other images of unusual objects that one might find in the environment. I'm now going to hand over to Tony, who's going to talk about healthy planet <coughs> and the planetary perspective. Yes, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and uh, begin to draw the connection to environmental sustainability. And I think this is a very arresting place to start, this uh, quote from The Lancet last year. It was uh, a paper following a commission into the impacts of climate change on the health of people. And this was the conclusion of that commission. Climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. Now, I encourage people to 
think about that because many um, thinkers about climate change don't focus on what it means for human health. We often overlook the fact that it will affect us, it will affect our grandchildren, it will affect our grandparents. And uh, so it's a very important starting point when we think about the health of the planet. Now this, this slide here, um, while busy in one sense in terms of words, I think is useful to begin to explore the links between climate change and health. It was developed by my colleague, Tony McMichael, who uh, works with me at Australian National University. And he's arguably the world's leading thinker and researcher on climate change and health. And so this is a, a way of representing the range of potential relationships between climate change and the health of people. On the left, uh, climate change. On the right, health impacts. And you can see there's three broad groupings of those relationships. The first one at the top, the direct impacts. In many ways, these are the most obvious uh, uh, relationships. Uh, heat waves can affect the health of people. Floods, fires, storms, water shortages. The second grouping there on the left are what we call indirect system-mediated uh, impacts of climate change on health. And they uh, can be characterised in three subgroupings. Changes to physical processes and systems, uh, changes to biological processes and timing, and changes to overall ecosystem structure and function. And so the first one, the changes to physical systems and processes, a good example of that would be urban air pollution. Uh, there is an interaction between air pollution and weather, and we see that in Sydney on certain days of the year. So under a changing climate, we can anticipate that the risk to human health from even current levels of air pollution in a city like Sydney will be greater uh, in a, under a changing climate. When we think about biological changes and timing, a good example is mosquito density. So changes to climate will affect the distribution of mosquitoes. And in Australia, one of the potentially very important <coughs> issues is the potential for rising rates of dengue fever in the northern part of Australia, where an increasing number of Australians live. And one of the reasons that that may happen is because we will increasingly use tanks to store water. And unless we manage those tanks well, they can be very good breeding grounds for those mosquitoes. So that's an example of a response to climate change, a very sensible built environment response to climate change that may, unless well managed, put people's health at risk. And the third uh, grouping is changes to ecosystem structure and function. And this is when we think about uh, changes to, to fisheries, changes, constraints on microbes, the potential for increases in other infectious diseases, uh, other issues like forest productivity, and indeed broader nutrient cycles. So we've got those two categories, the direct, the most evident, and the more indirect system mediated. But on the right there, you can see the third category, and perhaps the most important category, the flow-on effects from a social, economic and demographic perspective. A good example of this would be the, uh, the drying that we're seeing in rural Australia, the impacts in the Murray-Darling Basin that are being heavily debated and importantly debated uh, as we sit here this evening. So the drying of rural Australia will af affect the the productivity of Australian farms, that will affect the incomes of Australian farmers, the, the uh, sustainability of rural communities in our country. So that has impacts on mental health and community wellbeing. And indeed, you only have to look at suicide rates among Australian farmers to see that we have already got a problem in that area. So this is a way of beginning to understand the potential scope of the relationships between an unhealthy planet uh, where climate is changing and the health of people. More specifically, here's some data from the heat wave in southern Australia in 2009. This data from the Chief Health Officer in Victoria. Uh, for the week uh, beginning the 26th of January that year uh, through to the 1st of February. And what's shown here in the dotted line is the temperature. Uh, and you can see that during that week, it rose from the mid-20s 
through to several days in, into the mid-40s before dropping back to the 30s. The blue line is the number of people we would have expected to die in Victoria that week. And this excludes the deaths that happened from the associated bushfires. So they're taken out of the calculation. The, uh, the red line is the number of people that died in Victoria uh, during that week. And you can see that uh, we would have expected uh, close to 100 deaths per day in Victoria in an average week. But during that week, we got more than 200 on several days. So there was more than 300 extra deaths that week attributable to the heat wave and the associated air pollution uh, and human health risk. So that's an example of the sort of things that are increasingly ahead for us. Now to connect this back more specifically to the way we think about cities and the built environment, uh, I point you to a conference we held in 2006 at the Australian Academy of Science on the theme of urbanism, environment and health. This was an effort to integrate thinking about the urban way of life, the health of the environment and the health of people. We brought together health researchers with built environment researchers, with folk from policy and industry. And we developed this framework from uh, that conference. And I hope it's, uh, it's clear enough up the back as well. So we call this a framework for urban sustainability and population health. And it's a way of bringing together concerns about the future of the environment with the concerns about the health of people. So on the top uh, horizontal axis there, we've divided what constitutes a, a, a city into six broad domains. The economy and work in the city, the transport and urban form, urban layout, the housing and buildings, the nature and landscape, media and communication, and the cultural and spiritual dimensions. Of course, as cities aren't six silos like that. You know, cities work as systems they're, when they're functioning. And as a consequence of the makeup of that city, the nature of the work, the nature of the business, uh, for example, the city will have a footprint on the planet. So that's the, the story of the horizontal axis there. The story of the vertical axis is about what we would call determinants of human health, determinants of human health and well-being. So we've got things like the air quality, uh, water quality, noise exposure, uh, local climate, the access to food, the physical activity, the things Susan was talking about, the safety of the environment we inhabit, our family relationships, and the broader uh, social capital. Many health researchers and health thinkers, health planners, health workers are thinking about the relationship between those determinants, those factors, and the health of people. Whereas many built environment professionals are thinking on the top axis about the relationship between the nature of the city and in particular its impact on the environment. So what's the point of a framework like this? Essentially it's all about what's in those uh, cells in the middle there. The grid shows that in those cells there's an opportunity to think about research questions, policy questions, planning questions and explore those relationships between the type of transport we provide, what that means for human health, at the same time as what it means for the health of the planet. So integrating our thinking, integrating our decision making. And indeed, there is a good news story here. As Susan said, there's a, there's a, a, a negative story, but there can be a positive one. And just this year, uh, we held another Academy of Science Fenner conference on this good news story. And this is the story of the low carbon way of living. Because a low carbon way of living is likely to be a healthy way of living. Whether we think about physical activity, you know, the, the bicycle is a low carbon way of transport, it's also a healthy mode of transport. Green energy generation uh, has less toxic emissions as well as less greenhouse gas emissions. So the health of people in places like the Hunter Valley or the La Trobe Valley will be improved if there's a transition to uh, renewable energy. It, 
So it's the long-term health of the environment as well as the short-term health of people. Of course, we have to think about the safety net for people whose industry is changing and the loss of jobs. There needs to be a transition in the economy at the same time. Food choices, a vegetable-rich diet, which is a low-carbon diet, is a healthier diet. Healthy housing, designed, oriented, ventilated, to reduce the need for heating and cooling, is also likely to create an environment internally that's healthier and where people can be more productive in the workplace indeed. So this, this positive story is about getting the decisions and orienting them and thinking about them for the benefit of people and the environment at the same time. And indeed, I'll finish with this, uh, this triangle, this idea of a, a biosensitivity triangle proposed by Stephen Boyden, who's one of Australia's leading scientists, uh, uh, an immunologist and a human ecologist. And the essence of this diagram is to illustrate that the decisions we make, the decisions about place at all scales, as Susan has well illustrated, can potentially have direct impacts on the health of people. And they will also have impacts on the health of the planet via the footprint, the greenhouse gas emissions and other changes. And there's potential flow on impacts from those planetary health changes to the health of people. So when we're thinking about our decisions in our professional lives as built environment professionals, as public health professionals, we need to think about both of these things in an integrated way. So I'll now pass back um, to Susan. In this last part of our lecture, we'll give you an overview of Australian policy and practice initiatives that support the creation of healthy built environments. In 2009, the National Government's preventative health strategy was released with significant recommendations for supportive environments and, uh, for health. And I was delighted to be part of the inquiry and equally delighted, as I know Tony and other colleagues were, to see these healthy built environment recommendations. The Federal Government Department of Infrastructure Australia released its first report of the State of Australian Cities this year. The first time in over a decade that the Federal Government has had an involvement with city policy. Tony and I participated in a think tank as part of the national consultations for this report, which specifically identifies health as an important component of the livability of Australian cities, as well as a critical aspect of the work of built environment professionals. Healthy Spaces and Places is a landmark collaboration partnership advocating for healthy built environments. <clears throat> the Planning Institute of Australia, the National Heart Foundation and the Australian Local Government Association work together to produce this excellent web-based resource for for both built environment professionals and health professionals and very much for students engaged in, in this work, the creation of healthy built environments. And the National Heart Foundation has indeed been a long time crusader for healthy built environments with significant policy and advocacy work in this area. And I, I often say this when I speak to people, if somebody had said to me 20 years ago, maybe, well, certainly 30 years ago, which is more than uh, when I started out my career in planning, that I would be working in close partnership with colleagues at the National Heart Foundation, it would have just been ridiculous. But I am indeed working in close collaboration. We are just about to start a major research project funded by the Australian Research Council and partners, National Heart Foundation and LANCOM and the Sydney Southwest Area Health Service with us here in the built environment. So the work that the National Heart Foundation has done, uh, pretty much, well, the very seminal work back in 2004, not that long ago, Healthy by Design, many of you might well know this excellent resource, which won a Planning Institute of Australia award more recently, their 
position statement on walking and they're doing more work on developing walking strategies. Unfortunately, well, not really unfortunately, but a colleague from Victoria sent me an email the other day with, ha ha, we've got a walking strategy and you haven't, <laughs> because she knows how passionate I am about healthy planning. And indeed, Victoria does now have a walking strategy released just the other day. Its overarching objective is to encourage people to walk by changing attitudes and behaviour, making walking the first choice, the easy option, and that's supported by different strategies in policies throughout the document. But we'll be getting a walking strategy soon in New South Wales. Um, no, we will be, and that, that will be terrific. And I think there's very important synergies in walking and cycling, but also equally important to separate those two <coughs> very important physical, activity, uh, physical activities as part of healthy uh, cities. There have been a raft of strategic policy and local planning initiatives, and I had a really hard time deciding. I think I've had about, I don't know, 10 more slides, and I thought, no, 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 too many. So just to say, many, um, local plans, many metropolitan strategic plans, regional plans across Australia, designs, neighbourhood designs are all incorporating much of the work that I spoke about earlier in relation to creating healthy built environments. Neighbourhoods with walkable destinations, pleasant, interesting and safe streets and a well connected street pattern the traditional grid pattern that you can see in the model here on the right, which is actually a model of Rouse Hill in Sydney's northwest. These are all qualities that are positively associated with higher and enhanced levels of physical activity, healthier cities. The state government in New South Wales um, in particular, New South Wales Health, through its New South Wales Health Plan, has identified the built environment and urban planning as significant areas for health. And in New South Wales, we have an incredibly important partnership that is being um, developed and built by the Premier's Council for Active Living, or PCAL, as it's fondly known, under the, um, under the umbrella of bringing together many of the key stakeholders across health and the built environment. PCAL now is indeed a leader, not only in New South Wales and Australia, it's got an increasingly, um, a growing international reputation and well deserved. And if you haven't visited the PCAL website, and use some of their resources, I commend it to you. New South Wales Health has also supported some very significant initiatives such as this one, the Healthy Urban Development Checklist, which is a guide, if you like, um, a very comprehensive set of guidelines, checklists, particularly focusing on assisting health professionals to assess developments for for, um, for future developments and planning policies that are uh, to ensure that they are supportive of health. And our own Healthy Built Environments program here in the City Futures Research Centre, as Professor Zahn said earlier this evening, New South Wales Health has provided the core funding of $1.5 million over five years for our centre. We work across three areas, research, leadership and advocacy, and education and capacity building. And I won't go into the detail that I, that I certainly could. Um, time is, is getting away. But please have a look at our website and we have um, a lot of information about all of our activities on the website. So finally, some challenges and opportunities for healthy placemaking and healthy placemakers. Many challenges and indeed opportunities in working together across our disciplinary boundaries. 
working with different knowledge bases and research traditions. That is very interesting when you, you bring together people from health, people from planning, people with design expertise. The sorts of ways of doing things are often different and we have to learn how to talk, to share, to cross these boundaries that no longer serve us at all well. I see increasing interdisciplinary education as an incredible opportunity and we're doing a lot of this here in the built environment faculty and you can read a bit about that if you wish on the Healthy Built Environments program. There is much to do, much more research to do in the recognition of diversity and local context in understanding how to best make a healthy built environment that is going to be appropriate for all people. And as Tony has very succinctly and eloquently put, linking environmental sustainability, climate change with human health and the benefits of working on all of those things together is an enormous opportunity as well as a huge challenge. Well, in conclusion, let us say that healthy built environments are those which support people's health and well-being as part of everyday living. They can only be created and sustained through committed and interdisciplinary engagement of researchers, policy makers, planners, designers, health professionals and many of the wonderful students who are sitting in this audience today and inspire me and I know Tony constantly. And as directors of the City Futures Healthy Built Environments program, both Tony and I are excited about the opportunities that we have to create healthy and sustainable built environments for the future. Thank you.